Morata, Morata, il destro, bene per Di Bala, sinistro, gol! Lewandowski, ball rein mit den Imenze, Schieber mit dem Kopf, Reus, Quer, Linie, Tor, 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 Tor! Cristiano Ronaldo para el Real Madrid. Il est passé le gars, il est passé. Il va tenir ce ballon, le remettre dans la oh, Quel but Quel but extraordinaire oh, André Hello and welcome. You are indeed very welcome to your place for all European football news and reviews. It's the Football Hipsters Podcast. I am your League One hipster and your host, Chris, and joining me as ever, I have a Serie A hipster, which is a John. Good evening, John. Evening, Chris. And I have a La Liga hipster, who is Tom. Good evening, Tom. Evening. And of course, running out the bunch, I have a Bundesliga hipster. I have Drew. Good evening, Drew. Good evening. And you join us on this fine Monday evening where it's freezing cold in the United Kingdom. I'm sure it's not in New York, is it, Drew? You lucky devil. <laughs> Without uh, further ado, though, we shall rattle into our show this week. Is that without further or Drew? Oh, very good, Tom. Very good. He's wow, well played indeed. He's been eating his <laughs> hey. Right, we will start, gentlemen, as we do every week. Uh, I think it's somber times this week. We will begin with our mighty 90. Right, uh, as I said, I think it's not particularly good news for anyone this week. Um, well, we shall see. Drew, I know this might be a little bit painful, but we are going to start with you, my good man. So uh, <laughs> I shall uh, put the time on the watch and your mighty 90 begins now. Okay. Well, uh, I, as much as I would like to sit here for 90 seconds and say nothing and hope something can change by next week, I can't. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Feyenoord uh, went to PEC Zwolle and, and lost 3-1. Uh, <laughs> so the, the bad run continues again. Uh, unlike last week where we decided to go with a 4-1-4-1, uh, Giovanni Van Bronckner switched back to a 4-3-3, and it didn't work. Uh, once again, uh, Elhar Elia and Michel Kramer were both on the bench, uh, both made cameos, and both didn't do anything. Thing off the bench. Uh, and in fact, the only players to really perform well, um, Bessa Soglu and Jens Tornshow, that they both did pretty okay. But again, a little bit worried now. Terence Kungo had yet another poor showing um, at left back. And it, so now, in the beginning of the season where we really relied on our defense, now we're actually sort of struggling to stop scoring goals now we can't score any so the reverse has happened and it, it's it's the reason why we're showing it right now so i ended up losing 3-1 uh lars veldvik had a a brace and then uh kingsley Ehibu, uh Ehizibu had the third sven van beek had our only goal against Twinder got the assist he's been in good form but um i'm actually pretty worried at the moment right now so <laughs> we haven't won since back on december 6th when we beat heracles at home we now sit in sixth place we've lost seven matches in a row uh, I don't know what more I can say, except something has to change next week. Uh, hopefully it will. Uh, we get to travel to Utrecht, though. Uh, and they're in uh, patchy form, but sitting in seventh, so we'll see how it goes. Good. Well, I say good. It's not good, so is it, but uh, tough times. Is there any pressure on Van Bronckhorst there to keep his job? I mean, there's always going to be pressure on a Feyenoord manager when they're not doing well, but if he does lose his job, um, it wouldn't be till end of the season. Um, but he needs to be concerned for sure. Seven seven losses in a row after such a good first half of the season. The questions have to be asked for sure. Seven defeats in a row. That's tough. Yes, we will um, we'll touch on the Eredivisie probably next week, actually. So uh, hold on to your hats. Right. Speaking of holding on to hats, it's uh, it's my turn. I'm going to go second this week. So uh, I shall put the uh, time on the clock. My mighty 90 for Lorient begins now. So uh, this week, Lorient played uh, Nantes in, in a derby. It's the Breton derby. Uh, that was in the Stade de la Bejour Louis Fontenou Stadium. It's uh, 22,256 people watched the game. And it was a game where nil-nil previously during uh, during the, the Christmas period. We were hoping for goals. Uh, we did get them, unfortunately, not in Lorient's favour. Nantes dominated the early stages. Uh, but for Benjamin Lecomte in the Lorient goal, Bedoya would have scored. 
but then just 10 minutes later it was indeed the American whose cutback was finished off by the Brazilian Adrian and it was 1-0 very early on disappointing Nog continued to dominate the game and 5 minutes before the break Thomason's cross was met by the, the leaping Emiliano Sala bulleted the, the uh, header home for 2-0 and at half time, the Laura manager, Silvan Ripple, did make changes. Those would be taking off his left back, who was skinned, Lagoff. Uh, Laura were a lot better second half, but it took till the 79th minute for Lemelo to get a lifeline. For Fala was brought down, somewhat harsh penalty in truth, but it was awarded, and then Jimmy Mukanju stepped up to score his 12th of the season to make the score 2 1. But with time running out, Lamine Gassam is sending off for a late lunch and all hope was gone. It's only one win in nine for Lorient now. It's uh, slightly worrying times. We're sitting 14th and only four points above the drop zone. And uh, the next game is a home tie with Gangob on Saturday. And to be perfectly honest, it's one of those dreaded must-win games. So there you go. That's, uh, that's Lorient. So two defeats out of two. Can we turn this run around? Let's see. Austria, Tom, what's been going on with Salzburg? Your Mighty 90 begins now. No, no, we can't. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know what's worse, the fact we lost or the fact that Soriano's injured. Um, yeah, so basically he has a hip injury. Uh, it meant he, met, he uh, missed our game uh, away to SV Reed. Uh, it seems it's, he's only out for two to three weeks, so not a massive injury. Um we start with a front line of Barisha, Damara, and Minamino, uh, and it started off pretty badly. Um, they had, Reed had plenty of chances. Froschel, their striker, testing Valka on two occasions. The first one, splitting defence pass through, and he it was a, a point blank shot which Valka saved with his chest. And, and then he had another chance uh, where the weak back pass from Coletta Carr allowed him to get in again, and Valka again had to make another save. Uh, Reed had another first half chance though through Hoschel, a header which. Valka again easily saved. Uh, Salzburg really took the second half a lot more seriously. Uh, the substitute Prevel Yak getting many more chances, skying over the bar and hitting one wide of the left hand post. Froschel eventually did get his goal though. Uh, a read, a perfect pass from from Trauner, uh, found the Austrian who clearly, uh, cleverly finished round Valka, and and that's how it finished. Uh, we do remain top though uh, because in the Austrian uh, Vienna derby, uh, Vienna lost three 0 to Rapid, which is quite nice for us because it means we stay top only on goal difference though. Um, but a three 0 win for Rapid is quite worrying, and we do go to play Rapid soon, and we play Austria Vienna in two weeks. Our next match is at home to Altac which we should win. So hopefully better times for us in the future. We can but hope. We can but hope. It's just a pretty sombre affair so far. And uh, yeah, yeah we, we shall see if we can turn this around. Uh, John, it, it, it's your time. Munch and Gladbach got back to winning ways last week, so I'm fully expecting it to be good news this week. Your Mighty 90 begins now. Um, yeah, never mind. Uh, we lost as well, so 4-4, four, four, brilliant. Um, even worse, we got beat by a meat patty. Um, we lost 3-2 uh, away to Hamburg. Um, it's about as funny as I can get in that. Um, <laughs> just really weird game. Got off to the perfect start. Uh, our former striker, Joseph Dermich, who's now at Hamburg, um, being denied at one end, wasting a really good opportunity, which is what Joseph Dermich does. Um, we broke up the other end. Hazard squared a ball. Fabian Johnson, lovely, 1-0. Um, but then the curse of our awful, awful uh, set-piece defending, as it has been all season. Uh, Gideon Young's effort was deflected off of Hinterliga, Um to make it 1-0. Um, the second goal was, I must say, is a very good finish from Rudnevs uh, for Hamburg, but poor defending yet again. Um, the third from Ivo Lichevic, Lichevic, I probably said that horribly wrong, um, also from a set piece, so it's 3-1, um, we did get a goal back, uh, Raphael getting a goal late on, but just so many wasted chances for us in a game, awful defending from set pieces, um, I think that's something like 50% of the goals conceded this season have all been from set pieces now. Um, so not great uh, next game we were at home to FC Köln um, it was good to see Zaka back and as you see a slightly worrying stat though is that our goal uh, our points ratio in games with Zaka was uh, just over two points without him it's just under one so a bit worrying for the season go forwards Yes, tough, tough times. Good to have Big Granit back, though. Hopefully that will do you good. Yeah, I'm, I'm more worried about what happens in the summer if he leaves because the, the point ratio with him in the team and without him is dreadful. So, indifference. 
Oh dear. Well, it's safe to say it's been a pretty crappy week for all of our Mighty 90 sides. So <laughs> the, the less said, the better. We will move on and forget all about this week. So uh, let's just move on to all things European football then. And we will start, as we always do, with this week's World of Football. Right then, so World of Football Stats this week. Let's run through the stats as we always do. Premier League this week, 34 goals, three clean sheets, two red cards, three home wins, six away wins. That's from the uh, the 10 fixtures. In Liga, there was 27 goals, four clean sheets, one red card, four home wins, three away. In La Liga, 33 goals, the highest, oh sorry, second highest scoring uh, league this, this weekend. Six clean sheets, one red card, seven home wins, just the one away win. And in Serie A, 28 goals, three clean sheets, three reds, four home wins, four away wins. Nice bit of symmetry there. And finally, in the Bundesliga this weekend, 26 goals and three clean sheets, one red card, six home wins, two away wins. So the weekly totals then 148 goals across our big four leagues in Europe, 19 clean sheets, eight red cards, 24 home victories, 16 were away from home. And that was across the full 49 games. So so uh, a pretty decent week overall for incidents and for goals. So it's, uh, it's a decent way to to take our first leap into our league roundup. And I've decided this week we are going to start in Italy. And we'll start with this week's Serie A. Right, John, there was a big fixture, which we will come to in a second. But we'll want to start with the fixture between Lazio and Hellas Verona. This was actually played on Thursday, I think I'm right in saying. I, I have no idea why. Maybe you would know more than I would. But how did it go? And uh, bless Hellas Verona, are they improving? Um, no, it was yeah, it was Thursday. Originally, I thought it was because of Europa League and Champions League games. But it was actually because of the uh, RBS uh, Rugby Six Nations um, going on. Um, I think it was England against Italy, maybe. I don't know. I don't follow rugby. I know someone played against Italy, um, and that was why the fixture was moved. It's, anyway, uh, it's, ru- it's rugby, so it's not a sport. So <laughs> <Yeah. don't worry. laughs> um, no, it, it wasn't good news for Verona. Um, they'd been on a five-round unbeaten run. Uh, it came to an end. Um, Lazio also on a bit of a goal drought before this game, but managed to score five. Uh, the game finished five-two. Um, I'll try and get through the goals quickly. Uh, uh, Matri opened the scoring for Lazio. Uh, Stefano Mauri then getting the second. Um, Felipe Anderson scored a very strange third goal. Um, he, he ran through beating sort of three or four players, then was dragged down, which was clearly a foul on the edge of the box. The referee gave nothing. Anderson appealed whilst on the floor, nothing happened. So then, while still appealing on the floor, realised the ball was still at his feet, uh, nutmegged a player whilst laying on the floor, um, passing it out wide, who then, uh, I think it was, was it closer? No, Milinkovic Savic, sorry. Out on the left-hand side, who then squared it back in for Anderson, who had the time to get back up on his feet and, and put it in. Um, just really weird sequence of play. Um, so it was 3-0 Lazio. Looked like it was all cruising. Um, not many fans there to celebrate, because even more of the Olympico had been closed after the uh, the problems they'd had playing against Napoli with a racist chance towards Koulibaly. So uh, even less fans in there to see them being 3-0 up. Um, but then they almost managed to throw it away. Um, uh, Leandro Greco came on for Verona, um, scored a brilliant free kick. I think it was his first touch of the ball in the game. Um, and then Luca Toni did what he did his best and got on the end of the cross to make it 3 2. Uh, Lazio looked like they were going to have a little bit of a wobble, maybe throw the game away. Um, but then um, Greco, who had done so well to score the free kick for Verona, gave the ball away to uh, Miroslav Closer, who charged up the pitch not showing his age at all, and dinked a lovely ball across the edge of the box for Keita to volley it. Um, and then Lazio got a last-minute penalty, which was converted by Kandreva, leaving it uh, 5-2. So, really good result for Lazio. Uh, lots of goals, which they needed. Um, disappointed for Verona, but probably a game they didn't expect to get too much out of. Do you think, with this result, that that dooms Verona? I mean, they're, what, 15 points there? Oh, 10 points from, from safety. I mean, they're 10 points just to get out of the relegation bottom three now. Is this kind of a bit looking curtain-z now? 
Um, yeah, the run they were on, although they still only got the one win, the five unbeaten run looked quite good for them, and there was like a hint of them getting out of it, but I think it's going to be too much now. It, I mean, it really depends. If Samp's poor form carries on, then maybe they get dragged into it, but it's going to be very difficult for Verona to get away from that bomb. Yeah, yeah, it is going to be a, an uphill task, and uh, certainly with the news that Trois have won again, which we'll come to in a minute, that's uh, that's making them the worst team across the big four leagues in Europe now. Not good. Anywho, let's move on. Now, there was a rather big game on uh, Saturday night, which uh, I almost lost my job over. Um, I said last week that if there wasn't goals, or at least a goal between Juventus and Napoli, in the Saturday night kickoff, I would resign. Well, I'm still here, so there was a goal. Uh, two minutes from time, John. Um, talk us through this game. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was 1-0 in the end to Juventus, um, which doesn't sound exciting, but it was probably the best game of the weekend that I, I saw live anyway. Um, and it was Simone Zatza, of all people, who scored the goal, winning goal for Juve, and it was an absolute cracker as well. Um, not someone I've been particularly nice about. Um, he is Juventus' fourth tri- choice striker for a reason, but um, it was a wonderful goal and it's, it's well worth looking up. But, I mean, as you say, it was right near the end of the game. Up until that point, what you saw was two teams who could dominate the ball when they needed to, who could sit and defend when they needed to, keep possession when they needed to. Um, some of the defending on display was absolutely amazing. Um, probably, actually, the highlight of the game was actually Leonardo Bonucci um, clearing the ball uh, there, there was a great cross in uh, from the right hand side and Gonzalo Higuain was dead set to score to break the uh, deadlock in the game and Bonucci just I don't know he must be doing yoga or something because the way he threw his body to, to get his foot on the end of the cross to, to stop Higuain from scoring was absolutely amazing um, the best chance of the game probably actually fell to Paolo Dybala um, on the edge of the box and he put it just over the bar um, but just amazing defence for both teams um, Higuain literally had one shot I think in the entire game which was a really scruffed effort and sort of more out of frustration than anything else uh, really impressive from Juventus considering that Chiellini wasn't in the game and Bonucci actually went off injured as well uh, so young uh, Daniele uh, Regani uh, had to come on uh, in, in defence and they changed the system slightly to it had to accommodate more of a back four than the back five they usually play um, but really really impressive really, really impressive game um, definitely one if you can get the highlights of well worth watching yeah, I think it was uh, sort of criminal there wasn't more goals, but uh, Higuain leaving the pitch practically in tears. Um, just sort of a sign of how much this meant. What is it, 15 on the spin for Juve now, winning-wise? That is, I think that was game number 16, actually. 16. That might be, yeah. Is that 15 or 16? I can't remember now, there's so many. But yeah, that, that, ended, that ended Napoli's eight-game run as well. Yeah. So. They're yeah. on a charge, aren't they? On a mm-hmm. charge. Speaking of, of on a charge, that takes us nicely to uh, one of the Milan clubs, uh, Milan themselves, in fact, who entertained Genoa on the uh, on the Sunday, one of the Sunday fixtures. How did this one go, and uh, and how are Milan s- s- kind of settling to uh, to recent form? Yeah, um, it was. It finished two one to Milan. Um, it was a really good game. Uh, probably should have been more goals for Milan. They didn't finish. Uh, uh, as many chances as they created, and it was the Kazuki uh, Kazuki Honda show. Really, um, he was really, really good in this. Um, they got an early goal through Carlos Baca, um, a short corner routine. It didn't quite work. Uh, Montalivo played the ball back out uh, to Bonaventura, who was actually offside, so he just ran away, and it looked like he was going to roll out for a goal kick. But Honda kept it in, swung the ball in, Baca unmarked to the back stick, and just fired it in. Um, after that, it was all Milan pressure. Uh, Honda was shooting just on sight from everywhere. Um, Genoa were just throwing bodies in front of it, and the keeper doing some really good saves. Romagnoli coming close as well. Um, but then probably the goal of the weekend uh, for me anyway, of all the ones I've seen, uh, Honda scored. It must have been 40 yards out. Absolutely levered it. And he got curl and everything and whip on it. The keeper had no chance. Great goal. Uh, Montalivo tried to top him, though. They had uh, another uh, set-piece routine from a corner, and he was uh, standing just on the top of the D. Uh, corner swung in, and he took it on the volley first time, but he only managed to hit the post um, for that. Certainly would have been some goal. Um, Alicia Churchy, who's uh, who's at Genoa from Milan, actually, who was being jeered all day, did get the one goal back for Genoa, but that was in injury time. Um, but really, really improving signs for Milan. Uh, Jerry Menez also came on as a sub in this game, so he's back in, back in the mix for that team. Um, so they're starting to slowly improve and look, look more like a team but uh, Mihailovic was very impressed with Honda's goal 
Yeah, it was a very, very good strike. He, he certainly did leather it. And good to see the old Phantom Menace back in, in tow because he yeah. was very good for me there last year. And such a talented player when he's on his game. So good to see him back. Let's, um, let's round off with uh, Palermo, who entertained Torino at home. There's, um, there's quite the story of Palermo with regards to managers. Um, we could probably touch on this in the news section, but how did the, how did the game go? Uh, yeah, th- there were sort of two reasons why I wanted to touch on this. Uh, one was the fact this is the first time Torino beat Palermo uh, a- a- in Palermo since 1962, um, which is quite amazing. Um, Palermo actually got off to the lead, Giladino scoring like with inside two minutes, uh, just a ball around the back and a near post run, um, typical Giladino goal. But then uh, Torino just exploited the weakness that Palermo got down their right hand side over and over again. Uh, Bruno Perez is getting up and down that wing. Uh, Immobile won himself a uh, penalty, converted that. Um, Perez again getting down uh, Palermo's right hand side, swinging a cross in for Immobile, who was causing a lot of problems. Um, for Palermo all game, but it was actually uh, Giancarlo Gonzalez who actually turned it into his own net for an own goal. Uh, Immobile did get his second um, from a really nice uh, counter-attack. And the, the two reasons why I want to talk about the game, the, the score line sort of suggests that Torino were much the better side, but Palermo were actually a lot better than you think and did have some really good chances. And, and was it not for uh, Padelli in the goal for Torino, it, it, it probably could have finished a draw. Um, Immobile's form since coming back to Syria has been really impressive and it does give him that chance of maybe getting in the Italian national side for the Euros as we spoke about before but the, as you said in the news we'll go into it in a bit more detail but for this game uh, it was Giovanni uh, Bossi from the youth team who is the head coach on the sideline um, and there were some uh, fans in the stands asking with all signs up saying who is on the bench today uh, with the sort of run around that's been going on at Palermo but we'll go into more detail in that in the news. Yeah, that's, that's quite, quite the fan side, isn't it? you got to love that. Let's uh, give us a quick round-up of all the other results and, indeed, the uh, the table top and bottom end. Yep, uh, Roma's good run continues with a 3-1 win away at Carpi. Kiev Sassolo was 1-0. Uh, Frozenone got a good 2-1 win away at Empoli. Fiorentina beat Inter 2-1. I said about that the better. Um, San Patalanta was 0-0 and Udinese lost at home to Bologna 1-0. Um, so the table, because of the, the big game in the weekend, Juve and L top of the league for the first time this season one point clear of Napoli uh, so Juve on 57, Napoli on 56 and then there's seven points back to third place Fiorentina two points back to Roma uh, and then Inter and Milan um, so the table looking a bit more like you perhaps expect but the uh, the difference between the top two and the rest uh, is growing um, as you said Verona down at the bottom on 15 points, Carpi on 19, Frosinone on 22 and then uh, Samp and Genoa just above them on 25 points it's all getting tight, particularly for those Champions League spots. Good to good to see. What about this news then? So, so take us through the Palermo managership and, and anything else that's that's gone on this week. Yeah, the there's two, the only two bits of news really are Palermo uh, and Luis Adriano, who the mystery continues. Apparently, he's now staying at Milan and not going to China. So we'll leave that one because this is a big one to get through. Um, Palermo have changed manager. I can't count how many times, but I'm trying to try and get it all through. Um, so uh, Beppe Giacchini uh, was the manager. He was then uh, sacked on November 10th. Uh, Davide Balladini then came in and was sacked on January 11th. Uh, Shilotto, who a few weeks ago, I'm sure I told you all about, the Argentine winger, um, was brought in, but he didn't have uh, the correct work permit to become the manager so they had to put temporary people on the bench and he was just called a, uh, a team manager and not a head coach um, he then decided to leave Palermo because he couldn't get the work permit uh, so then the youth coach Giovanni Bossi took over for the game this weekend so which I think was their fifth different manager this season um, he now is no longer manager and J- uh, Beppe Giacchini has now been brought back in yeah that, that is just bizarre, isn't it? And there yeah, was the, so that's that's three months after he uh, had been sacked, has now been rehired. Right, yeah, there was the, the picture doing the rounds of the uh, Shilotto getting his shirt for his, his youngster as he left the club. And yep. there's a memento having been there for about a week. Just, just absolutely crackers, really. Yeah, uh, been there and not officially ever really been the manager as such. But yeah, very strange. Zamparini, who is known for hiring and firing managers whenever he likes, um, actually came out and apologised to the fans, which is very strange. Um, but yeah, there you go. You know, there you so go. Um, that's that's 
basically the news uh, in Syria this week because that's what everyone's talking about or sort of kind of laughing at Palermo uh, I suppose in a sense um, as for a game to watch for next week um, there's a good round of fixtures but the pick of the bunch is actually Monday night's game is Napoli versus Milan Ooh, that will be tempting uh, yeah. will, will be, will be tempted see how watch. Napoli bounce back and uh, yeah. um, if Milan can keep their run going I think I'm right in saying they play Milan and Fiorentina in between Vero and the, in the Europa League don't they so that's quite yes a... yeah. yeah that's why they're because Syria actually moves the team's fixtures to try and help them out in Europe. But there you go. Straight yeah, up. Funny idea, that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, super. Well, thank you very much. That's um, a Serie A done for another week. Uh, we will touch on something that we've got coming out later in the week, which all Serie A fans will want to tune into more on that later. But before we get to that, let's go to France. I shall hand over the reins to you, John, as we go inside this week's Ligue 1. Okay, so starting in Liga this week, uh, we are going to talk about Gangon Bordeaux, and I believe Bordeaux got a win away from home. They did, yes, uh, a much needed victory for for Bordeaux away, away from home because they're, they're consistently quite decent at home, but away from home they've, they've been poor. I think it's fair to say it's um, it's only their second away win at uh, away from their from their home ground in seventeen. Uh, so it gives you an idea of, of their away form. It's not the best. Another interesting stat for this game is the first time they've scored four goals away from home in 64 games. Uh, the last time they did that was actually against, yes, you've guessed it, Lorient in 2012. So that's quite a way back to uh, to score four goals away from home, but they've done it, and I'm sure they're delighted to have done so. Gangop, on the other hand, are in trouble. Uh, the pattern of the game in Unas and uh, Roland put Bordeaux two up early. Gangop showed some real fight. They got back to the game. Jaurès and Coco actually got them back to level pegging. But then uh, a goal from Clément Chanteau, we may remember from PSG, put Bordeaux back in front of the late Diabate goal. He can't stop scoring right now. He got the uh, the late fourth to, as uh, as Gangob pushed on to try and get the equaliser. But it's it's a damaging result for Gangob, who are another side who have got quite a limited budget. They rely on their home form quite heavily. So to lose at home to a side that doesn't win away is uh, is a, a little bit concerning for them. And it, and it plunges them back into trouble, which I'll touch on a bit later. But a good result for Bordeaux, uh, a much needed result for Willy Sagnol, who's their coach there, the, the former French international. He's been under quite a lot of pressure recently, so an away win will certainly do him some good. That is a name I've not heard for quite a while, Willy Sagnol. Wow. Um, now let's move on to Leon, who've been on a bit of a run of form lately. They have, they have. Uh, it, it's, I have to say, it's really good to see. I mean, they, they've been a club that has been so poorly mismanaged at, at so many different levels all season. And it, it's nice to see that there does seem to be some real camaraderie back in the side. Some of the young players are really stepping up, none more so than, than Corentin Soliso, who was exceptional once again for, for Leon this weekend. They ran out 4-1 winners over Khan, who, who have kind of fallen off a, a cliff, to be perfectly honest with you. Seven defeats in their last 11 for, for Khan, who, let's not forget, was second in the, in the table just a, a short month or so ago. But, but Leon the focus has to go on them really. I mean, they've scored 10 goals in their, in their last four, uh, sorry, the last three straight victories. They're, they're confident that they're back to enjoying their, their football and free flowing football. Again, it's great to see Samuel and Titi and, and Alexandre Lacazette put them two up in 16 minutes and the game was effectively done. Uh, Maxwell Corday got the, uh, the third right on the stroke of half time just to put the nail in the coffin. That man, Andy Delort popped up with a, a goal back for Khan, which, uh, kind of triggered a 10 minute spell where where Khan were, were pushing on trying to get the, the goal to, to put them back in the game but they couldn't get the second and then that man Toliso uh, let rip from the edge of the box on 83 minutes to to see off the uh, the, the the game opponents and it, it puts Leon back into a position where they can really start to fight for these Champions League spaces now I'll, I'll touch on it at the table but three straight victories 
they, they, they don't look particularly uh, sort of under pressure at the back now that they've sorted out a lot of their defensive issues with Mtiti's return to fitness. Lacazette is, is looking like a player who's who's got a bit of a point, point to prove now. And, and with the return of, of Nabil Fakir, sort of hopefully within uh, within the next month, uh, they should be set for a, a good run in and they should hopefully make that Champions League space again, which uh, which is important for them going forward. Yeah, look, I need that uh, money coming in, and um, also it's a it's a good incentive for Fakir and Lacazette for trying to push into the uh, French national team. Obviously, with the Euros coming. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, um, now, talking of the Champions League places, you had two other teams facing off: uh, Saint Etienne and Monaco. They're right up there as well. How did they get on? Yes, it was a, it's a good game. This actually, it was quite an entertaining affair. Saint Etienne and, and Bordeaux, as you say, next to each other on the table going into the game. Um, Saint Etienne unbeaten at home to Monaco since 2007 and that run has continued with a, a 1-1 draw. St Etienne, much the better side for most of the first half, would have been a bit unfortunate to come in not, not leading the game. But uh, Maya Sal with a header from a corner put them one up on 57 minutes. And uh, being Valentine's Day, you can think of no better scorer than Wagner Love, who uh, who got the equaliser for Monaco just six minutes from time, and and that was uh, that proved to be the uh, the, the point strip or point shared in, in a match that was it was kind of a bit scrappy at times. There was some quality at times. It, it was one of those that just ebbed and flowed. But it's a good watch, and and it's uh, it's nice to see a, a team like Saint Etienne who've got so much history, and they're they're sort of going creeping gently up the league again. Its consistency is is the issue with them. But um, no, they're, they're definitely on the on the improve. And as for Monaco, they've uh, they've been decent. Um, only one defeat in thirteen, so they're definitely sort of on the up themselves. I did want to highlight briefly on this the, in this game there was uh, Ron- Ronel Pierre Gabriel is uh, a name that might be worth keeping a note of. He's uh, he's a defender who uh, plays for Saint It's only his third appearance. He's he's a very very cultured footballer, and obviously from from a, a side that produced Kurt Zuma. Um, he he could be the next sort of big big thing defensively coming out of France. So composed, doesn't rush on the ball, likes to bring out a defence. Very very decent on the deck, good passing. So he's uh, possibly a name that, that people might just want to keep a note of and, uh, and maybe just check back in in, in, a, in a few months' time and see how he's progressing because he looks a talent to me. So there you go, listeners. Bit of insider information that you didn't know. Chris is in fact Newcastle's head scout. <laughs> <True> um, <that. laughs> <laughs> Last game I wanted to highlight is uh, Nice against Monaco. Um, nice missing their star player, unfortunately, for quite some time, it seems. Yes, Hatem Ben Arfa. Um, he is uh, out for approximately five weeks with a hamstring injury, which is a real blow for Nice. He's been, well, he's just been outstanding, absolutely outstanding this season. But it was the Derby de Sud, and it ended all square. Both of these fans absolutely detest each other, so a draw is uh, probably the worst possible result, or best, depending on which way you look at it. Um, but Nice, without Ben Arfa, just looked a bit kind of punchless. They did have the return of, of uh, Pelea, who, um, who came back into the forward position, but... Uh, just just didn't quite have that that cutting edge in, in a game that struggled for quality at times. Marseille missed a lot of good chances and probably will feel slightly disappointed they didn't come over with the win. They were in front with Isla, who you'll remember from Juventus. He uh, he put them ahead on 36 minutes from a corner. Uh, but Valéry Germain, who's a player I, I like just because he's just very old school, he popped up with the leveller for Nice on 58 minutes. And uh, yeah, on his even, it was, it was a decent watch. Uh, nice is, is still overperforming, I think it's fair to say, and uh, Marseille is really not a result that does them any favours, which we'll, we'll touch on on the table in a second. Yeah, um, do you want to just run through the uh, last few results and then give us the table? Yes, certainly. So, Ren, uh, they did it again. A last-minute stoppage time winner over Angers on Friday night. An own goal from Pukamba Mutu. Uh, it's the second time in a fortnight they've won in stoppage time. Um, Klaxon, PSG have dropped points. Yes, that's dropped points. Maybe their focus was on their upcoming Champions League game with Chelsea on uh, on Tuesday. They drew nil-nil at home to Lille. Um, and uh, most notably, Edinson Cavani back to his uh, his brilliant best missing from 10 yards with a fairly open goal. So that was good for him. Um, Gazalek Ajaxio, Sai, uh, they lost. And Twa have won again. So there's another klaxon for you. Uh, they won 3-2 away at Gazalek, and that puts Gazalek in all sorts of problems. We mentioned not Lorient, obviously. Montpellier, big, big victory for them, 2-11 to lose. And Bastia with a huge victory away at, Re- at, at Ram, sorry, by a goal to nil. So that rounds out the results as far as the table. Uh, PSG, yes, they dropped points, but then Monaco did as well. So it's as you were, they've uh, 70 points from their 26 
six games played. Uh, Monaco, well, they're close. 46 points in second, so it's not a big gap at all, is it? 24 points, my goodness. Nice are third, joint with St Etienne on 40 points. Lyon are up to fifth now on 39, joint with Nantes, who are really making a move. 39 points also. Uh, and then just Marseille, just to touch on them, at 11th now, 35. And then if you look at the bottom end, it's getting close. Twat still doomed, I think, 26 games, 14 points to lose also in the relegation zone 21 points and there's a six point gap to Gazalek and then you've got Ram Montpellier Gangob Lorient and Lille all close to each other down the bottom end of the table yeah, it's, it's very tight I mean feasibly even best year uh, could go on a run of a couple of games and jump all the way up to fourth it's very yeah. tight isn't it it is yeah if you've got what fourth place is 40 points uh, yeah. 12th past year 34 points so six points separating all those clubs it's, it's yeah. uh, people say it's not entertaining well it's probably not if you're a championship type of player but if you're a player who enjoys the Champions League or a mid-table scrap then it is Definitely. Um, do you want to pick out a game for us to uh, highlight for next week and any news? Yes, I will rattle through very quickly. Um, the obvious game probably to pick out, if you look at the fixtures, is going to be uh, the, the game between uh, Lille and Lyon is, is probably going to be worth a look. But I've actually gone for a slightly different one. Also, Marseille St Etienne. But I've gone for a slightly different one in a, in a weird roundabout way. I think this might be good. And it's Bordeaux versus Nice which is the Friday night game in the UK. I think it's on BT Sport as well, so you can catch that one Friday evening. And uh, We mentioned Bordeaux's home form, and obviously Nice flying high, so it should be worth a watch. As far as news, uh, you might have heard a story about a certain Serge Aurier this week. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's quite the story. We'll touch on it in the questions a little bit later on. We've had quite a few questions, but essentially he's been embroiled in a Periscope scandal uh, where he described the PSG manager Laurent Blanc as un fiote, which transfers to homosexual, or in some cases... Um, well, let's just say a meaty product that is enjoyed by lots of households in the UK, beginning with F. And um, when asked, uh, if he was asked about Laurent Blanc, he said that he uh, potentially sucks Zaslav Ibra- Ibrahimovic's male genitalia area. And Aurier's reply when asked this question was, he takes it all. Uh, he also described Gregory van der Veen as rubbish uh, and said he was wetter than water. Um, and he has also said that uh, Sirigu is is, uh, is terrible and his career is finished. So uh, I think it might be the case that Aurier's career at PSG might be in trouble. And uh, Zlatan has weighed in with some comments himself and he has demanded that the video be translated. Uh, the Ivorian has been indefinitely suspended by PSG. He will not be part of the plans for the Champions League game with Chelsea. Um, and I... To be perfectly honest, I'd be astounded if Laurent Blanc plays him again. Although PSG have said they want to keep the player. So that's one to keep an eye on. Just quickly to rattle through the other stories. Uh, Laurent Blanc himself has signed a contract extension with PSG to 2018. Ezekiel Lavezzi, he is off to China. at the uh, Apparently after the Chelsea match, that is going to go through, which is expected to make him 15 million euros net. Uh, yes, that's net. He's going to uh, a club called Hebei China Fortune, I believe. Interesting. Uh, lease their investment with the uh, Saudi prince that appears to have fallen through, which is a bit of a shame. Marco Verratti has signed a new contract with PSG until 2020. The final story of the week, Domino's Pizza are the pole position for uh, for potentially renaming Ligue 2 next season. Um, the, the report suggesting that from July, Ligue 2 will be renamed Ligue 2 Domino's for the next four seasons at a price of 1.4 million. So uh, if you want a pizza, that's obviously the, the, the place or the league to watch. Wow. League to dominoes, knock me down. Um, periscope stories, Aurea going down with the ships, awful. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> quickly moving on. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. I will hand back to you now and uh, stop the terrible puns. Probably best, thank you. Although I'm sure Tom will have some for us, because he always does. Right, let's uh, let's move on then, and uh, let's see what is going on as we take a trip to Germany and this week's Bundesliga. Right then, Drew, let's see what's, uh, what's been going on in the Bundesliga this week. I want to start with the uh, 
Oh, well, I want to start with the game between Mainz and Schalke. Now, this was a game that we've been saying for weeks, months, years, seemingly. <laughs> <laughs> Schalke are the most just totally cracker side. You, know, you just never know what you're going to get. They went away from home this week to a team that you thought, yeah, mid-table clash, can they win? And what happened? Well, Mainz actually won in front of their home crowd at the Coffee Arena 2-1. Uh, for me, like you just said, this is the reason why I, I struggle to really put Schalke in the conversation for a Champions League place. I've, like, like you said, like they're night and day. Some performances, you know, their last two performances actually, they they won their, their last two before uh, they beat Darmstadt two nil, um, <clears throat> and then they beat Wolfsburg three nothing. So. Those are the types of performances you think they would put in more consistently, but you know, again, at any moment in time, on one weekend, they're going to get a stinker. And, um, they didn't necessarily play poorly uh, against Mainz, um, but it definitely didn't sort of. Uh, we've seen a lot from them this season where they'll have uh, all the numbers in their favor, but they'll still lose. Um, they're not very good at uh, sort of putting, tucking a lot of their chances away, and, and didn't help that uh, Class and Hintler didn't really have a, a good performance. Uh, you know, Max Meyer and Eunice Belhanda did well. Belhanda actually opened his account for the club. He actually had the, the leveler after uh, Boosman put Mainz 1-0 ahead. Um, but at, they also struggled at the back a little bit. Um, Rothfarm and Arsenal didn't really have a good performance. Um, Johannes Geist didn't play well for maybe the, only the second time this entire season. Um, usually when they win, he does well. Um, and when they lose, he doesn't. So I, I think that trend sort of continued. But um, again, you know, I, I mentioned it before earlier, um, before the hidden window came to a close, that you, know, you should really expect Mainz to, to really sort of find consistency and maybe compete for a European place, and they've done that. They've won three in a row now, um, and they've they've done well in front of their home crowd. Uh, I think they've only lost four out of eleven at home, which for mid-table side is quite good. And they're actually undefeated in their last five um, in front of their home support. So um, that's what you want to see from a club like them. You know, if they can really make you know their 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 home, their home ground solid and, and when it comes to point production for them that's going to be the key if they're going to want to try to get a european place but again for Schalke, this is <laughs> this is why i don't see them making champions league I, this is why i would put you know Hertha and by leverkusen ahead of them in that fight but um a lot of time to go but maybe not the result that they wanted either so yeah consistently inconsistent as the famous saying goes um However, consistently consistent right now are Stuttgart. Now, they faced Hertha Berlin, who themselves have been pretty good this season. How did it finish up? They... <laughs> Well, they keep winning. They won 2-0. Uh, goals from Sari D and, and Philip Kosick, who's been one of their best players since uh, the second half of the season started. But again, um, you see that uh, Kramny has really sort of rubber-stamped his will and what what he wants out of the players in their performances. They're more consistent across the board. Um, but also, he, he, he a little bit of a, a tactical change now. We saw before he came in, they're more reliant, they're very reliant on a 4-3, flat 4-3-3, where um, there was no sort of tactical changing with the ebb and flow of the match, but now he's using a four-one-four-one a lot, um, which you know can switch to a four-three-three quickly if the two the two wide uh, midfielders in that flat four they can easily just become two wide forwards moving forward. But they're, they're expected to really come back and defend more. Uh, Lucas Rupp does that quite quite well for them. Um, he did it for Paderborn last season. He was one of the one of the better players for Paderborn uh, last campaign, and he's come to Stuttgart. He now he's doing much the same role. That sort of all action. Uh, two-way on the right flank, and that's given more uh, defensive stability when they don't have the ball. Costs uh, is much of the same thing. Um, Sarah D has, has grown and grown over the last couple of months. He's been very, very good as their holding midfielder. Um, they didn't even have Daniel Dadavi. He was suspended after he got sent off uh, last week, um, but they still put in that performance. They actually hurt only created seven chances all match long, and for a team that's sitting in third, um, it's got to be a job well done for Stuttgart. They kept a clean sheet. Titans look improved the second half of the season, so all across the board, Stuttgart's just been a much better team under Kramny. You know, he, he, they, they got to the, the winter break. He's had time to really sort of uh, uh, bringing his regime for very well from a tackle standpoint, and it's it's, it's paying dividends now. I think um, they have won five in a row. They're up to tenth, um, so that's a complete role reversal from the first half of the season. So uh, you'd have to put them in, as, as a, you know you would think they would they, they, they'd uh, uh, avoid relegation at this point for sure. But it's a long second half. But I, I like what I see from them. Yeah, a complete turnaround from last season where they struggled so much. It's just, just really good to see one of the old-fashioned names doing so well. 
However, one of the, the sides old fashioned names that are not doing so well. We had a, a bottom of the table clash, if you will, between the the great Werder Bremen and Hoffenheim. Two two key things to discuss here. Hoffenheim, I believe, have changed managers. Do uh, Julian Nagelsmann has come in, uh, as most people may have heard the name by now. But he's only twenty eight. But even in his young age, he's been on the management side of things for maybe, I think, six years uh, after he stopped playing. He got a very bad injury with Augsburg when he was 20. Um, and then he went right into management. He he came in. Um, he was managing the Hoffenheim under 19s. They were excellent under him. Um, they won the league and they finished runner up two and two years under his management. So now he's coming straight in. He knows the system. He knows the players. He knows the club. So a lot of people are, are making comparisons to how Pep came through at Barca, where he was a player. He then managed the B team. Had success there. Um, he found his feet there, and then they just brought him through their own system, a homegrown management option, and and now so they have. Uh, kind of a they're hoping for big things from Nagelsmann but um don't let the age fool you a lot of people speak very very highly of him Thomas Tuchel's come out and said um that he he rates him quite highly um everyone at the club respects him despite his young age so and of honestly a point I guess would be fair he has a lot of work to do at Hoffenheim but they still got a point in his first match so uh, that's a positive performance and they actually played a 3-4-1-2 in his first match um and they got a result out of it um so I guess it's not all bad from him. As for Werder Bremen, they, honestly, they probably should have won the match anyway. Um, but for me, they, they just they just don't do enough. Um, and I think I've been saying that all season long. You know, they have the, the, the worst defensive record in the league at the moment. And, you know, they may only be sitting 16th, and they're, they're not far away from um, getting security from the from the bottom two, certainly. But th- again, they just don't do enough for me. I think Uja had a poor performance, and he's been their only consistent source of goals so if he's not going to be getting any amount of scoring then it's going to be tough to see where any of Victor Skripnik's players are going to be getting any amount of goals if he's not doing goal scoring so um, disappointment for Werder Bremen a positive point for Julian Nagelsmann in the match where Hoffenheim probably should have lost um, but it's something for him to build on at least because at least it's sort of temporarily you know, put something that wasn't a loss in the column. So, yeah, yeah, it's tough. It is tough, and we, of course, wish Hoop Stevens the best as well. Who obviously stepped down due to heart Hopefully. issues. Yeah, absolutely. So, hopefully, um, everything goes well for him and his recovery. Let's uh, finish off with Darmstadt, who have been surprising a lot of people. They're still keeping their head well above water. They entertained Leverkusen at home this weekend. Uh, I believe Leverkusen got an away win. They did. They they won two one. They were actually down one nil at the half, and you almost thought that Darmstadt could pull off um, a, a very large scalp in their in their, their first season up. But no, um, Itek Sulu ended up getting a, an own goal in sixty second minute. Julian Brandt actually got the win on the seventy seventh. Sandro Wagner had the opener for Darmstadt on the twenty eighth minute. Um, but again, it was it was a good showing from them. Uh, honestly, <laughs> you could almost even for a very large portion of the match, they actually controlled proceedings. So they might feel just a little bit hard done. Uh, um, but this sort of shows that that that, that um, determination that Leverkusen showed to, to get a, a valuable three points it actually puts them up to third now because Hertel lost, Schalke lost. So the, you know they're still 13 points back of Borussia Dortmund, but they're they're in a bit of form at the moment, which is you know they think they've won four out of the last six. The other two have been draws. They've only allowed two goals in the process. So for them, it was important to sort of get more uh, stability and consistency at the back. They struggled early in the season with uh, allowing a fair amount of goals, not scoring enough. Now they're scoring uh, at a more consistent rate, and they're, they're definitely letting fewer in. A lot of that has to do with Jonathan Ta. He's been fantastic this season. I know you've spoken very highly of him from what you've seen. Um, so th- th- the scoreline may have not been the one they wanted to see. Um, it was a very even match. You know, Darmstadt are always going to counterattack no matter who they play this season. Um, but Leverkusen, they, they dug deep and they got the point or the three points when it mattered most of them. So that's what you'd want to see. And now, you know, because Moch and Gladbeck are struggling with their form, Schalke are up and down. Um, Hertha haven't won in their last four matches. So this is what Bayer Leverkusen wanted. Now they're, they're, they're where they feel like they should be. I think if you'd ask anybody of, of their support, as you would say that right below Bayern and, and Dortmund is where they would see Bayern because they wanted to finish. So this is what they want and this is what they're getting at the moment. Yeah, heading the queue, as it were, heading the queue indeed. I think they signed they quite signed quite a lucrative sponsorship deal with Jacko, didn't they, as well, for the new kits for next season, which yeah. should give them a few quid as well. Uh, give us the results then for the other the other games in the in the league this week and indeed the table. 
right. Oh, Dortmund uh, only won one nil, but three points are three points. Uh, Wolfsburg won two nil against Ingolstadt. Uh, Cole, SC Köln beat Eintracht Frankfurt three um, one, and uh, as John said, Hamburg beat uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach three two. Uh, Augsburg lost at home to Bayern Munich three uh, one. The table then it's uh, Bayern top on fifty six, Dortmund second on forty eight, Bayer Leverkusen third on thirty five, tied with Hertha, who's in fourth on thirty five. Uh, Schalke and Mainz are tied on thirty three points, and that rounds off the top six. Bottom three, it's uh, uh, Werder Bremen 16th on 20, Hoffenheim 17th on 15, and Hanover is still bottom uh, 18th on 14 points. Uh, match for next weekend? I have, I, honestly, I mean, there's probably better matches in regards to what you want to see, but I think Bayer Leverkusen and Borussia Dortmund could be very entertaining, so I'll pick that one. Yes, I'm, I'm not going to make the commitment I made last week, but I'd be surprised if there isn't goals. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to put the podcast hosting at risk um, at all. Oh. Um, in, in the absence of any sort of particular news, I suppose we, we should mention Holger Badstuber, who's had yet another piece of bad bad news with a, a broken ankle, which is going to keep him out. And I think I'm right to say all the Bayern Munich players wore T-shirts, as did Pep for the whole game, sort of uh, almost in tribute to him. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty terrible news. But um, I want to focus on something that I spotted uh, during the Bundesliga 2 match uh, between my beloved Paderborn, who were thumped, standard, uh, by Kausersleiten. And they were they were beaten 4-0, but there was there was a, a save in this game that uh, that I've tweeted the, the, the video out from our podcast account for people if they want to go look at it. But can you just uh, describe, if you can, the, the Marius Muller save for Kausersleiten in that game? Personally, I don't know if I can find the, the proper wordage to use. Uh, I... We, we we spoke pre pod taping. I don't think it's a it's a double save that you would really expect. I think he made a brilliant save um, off the header that came from the cross, but it's the it's the rebound one for me that sort of does it. And you have to. Some people are going to say that, and I personally said that I think it's it's more down to the the, the finish. The player shot it right at him, but how quickly Mueller got up to make that second save is what's also impressive. So I think it's a bit of both, but it's certainly a double save you would never expect to see in on the strength that you'd probably say it's one of the better saves you'll see over the last couple seasons at least. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely the best one I've seen for a long time, and the, the agility. If when you look at goalkeepers in training where they're taught to hit the deck, get back up and immediately be ready for the next shot, it's a fine example of that, and the way that the Kaiserslautern players kind of go to him, even though they're 2-0 up at the time, don't forget. It, Still congratulations. Yeah, really, really <laughs> was. And ironically, um, he was terrible last week for Kaiserslautern, so that's that's the life of a goalkeeper, but it's well worth a watch, so do pop along to our Twitter account at the FH Podcast, you can see a video of it somewhere down the timeline okay um anything else that's worth bringing up this week news wise no not really i don't think so i think we covered it. i think the Nagelsmann was the big thing i wanted to speak about just um honestly i think as, as you look at it more and more managers becoming younger and younger now um whether because they go right into management when done with their careers or they just start in the management track earlier on i think but don't be surprised if he if he has a few good surprising performances with Hoffenheim under his command. I think even though they might get relegated still, I think you'll still see an improved side under him. So just keep an eye on him for sure. Yes, indeed. He was offered a contract by Bayern to be part of their coaching staff, I think, preseason. So says you it don't all. get that if you don't have at least some shred of management ability in you. No, so. absolutely. Very, very true. We'll keep an eye on his uh, on his progress. Right. OK. Well, thank you, Drew. Let's, um, let's shift gears then and uh, wrap up our trip around the big four and we'll uh, nip off to Tom's neck of the woods and we'll talk a bit of La Liga. I wish it was my neck of the woods. It'd be much warmer. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. It would be uh, a lot more warmer than, than where we are, for sure. Let's uh, start, Tom, with Real Madrid, uh, that small club in Spain that no one's ever heard of. I jest. But they were <laughs> playing at home to Athletic Club or Bilbao, whichever you prefer. Cristiano Ronaldo, back to form, I believe. Indeed. Uh, Bilbao's been uh, a good record against them uh, at the Bernabeu. And uh, even without uh, Inaki Williams playing for Bilbao, that didn't seem to deter Bilbao in their efforts to get that uh, record undone. But it didn't happen. It was a, a 4-2 in for Rao in the end. 
they went one up really early on, three minutes in. Raul, uh, Ronaldo put them in the lead, uh, laying off from Benzema and CR7 on the left-hand side, ghosted round Exeter before firing across a right hole in the top right-hand corner. Really great finish. I, I really encourage you to go check that one out. Uh, and the usual dominant goal fest you think would ensue, but momentarily it was halted by Arasso uh, latching onto a poor Varane back pass and an easy finish to make it 1-1. Uh, James Rodriguez then produced his own moment of quality, producing a curling effort from the right-hand side into the bottom left hand corner also one to go check out uh Cruz then scored his first La Liga goal of the season uh really quite a surprising stat there smashing a central shot in after some good footwork in the box after a layoff from Ronaldo uh Varane was then dismissed though uh for a second second yellow after for, after using his elbow in an aerial duel with uh, Adoris um this did not deter Dos Bancos, however. Uh, Lucas Vasquez fizzed the ball across to Ronaldo, who brought the ball down excellently. Another good bit of feet, footwork and then smashed into the near post for his second goal. Um, El Estundo scored a consolation in the 90th minute of a, an excellent header, I must say, to make the scoreline more respectable, but that is how the game finished. Defensive errors at the back would worry Zizou, but uh, I'm sure he can be happy with the four goals at the end of the day and another three points to push towards the title. Absolutely, yeah. Wins is all you can expect. And speaking of wins, uh, the Yellow Submarines, uh, Villarreal, they were playing Malaga, who obviously you've touched on have been in pretty decent form the the past few weeks, even though they've had a a few defeats of late, but they've been overall improved. How did this one end up? Uh, Yeah, it ended up with a Villarreal 1-0 win, surprisingly. I put this down as my one to watch. Um, I didn't think there'd be many goals, but it was certainly one to watch in terms of two teams that are really in form this season. Um, so it started off the first goal was always going to be huge in the match and be the only goal in the game, in fact, with the 1-0 win coming from a Soldado shot. That man really has turned his form up in La Liga this season. Um, a, a shot in the a shot from outside the box on the right-hand side, quite centrally, more towards the left, and Kameni really should have done better. He's been excellent this season, but nothing really came of it. And uh, he, he pushed it into the right-hand side of the net, so it was quite unfortunate. Dos Santos had two great chances to finish it off with Villarreal, but couldn't take them. Bacambo also had a chance. And in the first half, Cop had a, a chance of Malaga to equalise. But there was no real other chances where either team could really take the game by the scruff of the neck. And it remained 1 0. So Villarreal go forward. I don't think it will deter Malaga too much. And, and next week, they're going to play Real Madrid uh, at home. So that is, that's a game you should be watching because Malaga have a very good record against Real Madrid. Yes. La Rosaleda, is it their home stadium? Is that right? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yes. Good. That'll be uh, good fun. That's a good atmosphere there, usually, when they play. OK. Uh, right. Now, the venue, the Mestaya, the manager, Gary Neville. <laughs> Did it happen? Oh, it would happen against my <laughs> my team, wouldn't it, Espanyol? Yeah, so you, you did call it last week. To be I fair, I did call it. I said if they are going to win a game, it is going to be against Espanyol. Um, <laughs> it, it was quite fortunate for Valencia because they got two of the best players back. Paco Alcacer returned from injury, and Diego Alves, their main goalkeeper, has come back. Not no deterrent on on Ryan, who's done very well in going, and how many when he's been called upon. But Alves is certainly a class above those two. Um, the the two worst form sides in the league at the moment, so it was always going to be a bit of a scrappy match, and it didn't start well for Valencia. They lost Abdenor early on in the seventh minute through injury, and Vaso replaced him. Um, Valencia hit the bar at the start of the second half, and if, you can see by me saying start of the second half, not much happened in that first half. And Espanyol had one chance, but that was about it. As I say, Valencia hit the bar early on in the second half. Uh, a burgy corner found uh, the new signing Duarte for Espanyol, who are headed home. Espanyol going one nil up actually, and. Uh, I was quite surprised uh, at them going 1-0 up because I thought the first goal would actually be the team that won it. But that was certainly turned around in the 71st minute by Negredo, uh, definitely easing the nerves of the Valencia crowd. Uh, The substitute latched onto a fortuitous layoff after a fantastic run by Cancelo, the right back, and finished easily. Um, A deflected shot, however, I must say. Cherishev, that new signing from Real Madrid on loan, won the game five minutes later, heading home a pullback cross from Fagouli to give Gary Neville his first La Liga win of the season. It has happened. It has happened. So expect there to be seismic tidal shifts and God knows what else. (laughs) Boy, did they need that result. Good for them. Good for him. Man City manager. Oh, no. (laughs) No, Not going to happen. Uh, Let's um, let's talk a little bit of Barcelona to to wrap up then. They had what on paper looked to be a not tough, but at at least tight looking game with Celta Hmm. Vigo, who've, you know, been decent, fairly fairly decent of late and and flying high in what top eight of the table. Uh, Didn't really end up being close, did it? (laughs) No, um, 
uh, the reverse fixture was was far from different as well. So Vigo running out four one winners, uh, one, probably the most surprising fixture of the season, um, and Barcelona definitely came out of a vengeance. Um, they did make good account of themselves, Sergio Vigo, though certainly in the, in the first half, especially Messi scored in the 28th minute with a free kick, sublimely. Probably my goal of the weekend in Spain was absolutely amazing free kick. However, the foul did occur at least 10 yards back from where the free kick was taken, so a bit of controversy there. Uh, Gudetti then was brought down in the box uh, by Alba, and and the striker uh, cemented his his place as a start, starting striker for Sergio Vigo, finishing the penalty off to make it 1-1 before half time. Um, Second half started, definitely came out of more of a vice about them. Messi chipped a beautiful pass through to Suarez, who coolly finished into the 59th minute. Um, Suarez got his second half goal for a cross-come shot from Neymar, which stabbed into the right-hand side of the goal. Really, it should have been a goal for Neymar, but Suarez sort of nicked it off him at the last second. Um, then it stayed at 3-1 right until the last 10 minutes of the match. Uh, and a penalty occurred. I'm sure I'm talking about this and everyone already knows about this, but for those who don't, um, Messi took the penalty, uh, laid off the ball to his right, and Suarez smashed in an easy finish. Really quite odd. Comparisons made between Cruyff, but that was a different style, and obviously the Perez henri penalty, which completely messed up and failed, but we can move on from that quite quickly. <laughs> um Yep, and then Rakitic and Neymar produced chipped finishes for Barca's fifth and sixth uh, to take Barcelona to their longest unbeaten streak in their history. 30 games, 93 goals, 16 conceded. Luis Enrique very much stamping his mark on the managerial history of Spain, and not just Spain, but in Europe as well. 30 games, quite impressive, quite mm. impressive. And we will we will touch on that penalty a bit more later on if we had a, had a couple of questions on that very subject. So we will come back to that. Give us, uh, give us the other results from the weekend and the table top and bottom. OK, so the early kickoff on Friday, or early, late kickoff on the early fixture of Friday was Sporting Gijon against Real Vallecano. Ran out as a 2-2 draw. Guerrero and Halilovic uh, scoring for Gijon and Fedor and Josebed, the man scoring his ninth La Liga goal of the season. Um, Deportivo also ran out 2-2 drawing with Real Betis. Uh, Bergantinos and Fair for Deportivo and Masunda, the on-loan midfielder from Chelsea, who's really been quite impressive in his two matches they've played for Real Betis. And Vargas getting Vargas rather getting the other goal for Betis. Real Sociedad ran out three 0 winners against Granada. Uh, or, this is a really odd name, but I'm going to have a stab here. Oizabal uh, scoring two goals, 21st and 65th minute, and Jonathan in between those in the 45th minute. Uh, Sevilla ran out very luckily for Chris because I know we had a bit of a bettings card on this one. Sevilla two 0 against Las Palmas. Benega and Gamero 69th from the 75th minute. That's Gamero 13th La Liga goal of the season. Really been quite impressive, impressive for that France team squad for the Euros. Um, Ibar continued their really impressive form 2-0 also against Levante. Borja Baston, another guy pushing for his European uh, place in the Spanish side. Uh, Adrian getting the second goal. And then Atletico back to their old ways, winning by one goal, by 1-0 away from home. And Fernando Torres got that goal. So it was 101st goal for the club. Nice to see him getting in the goals. And uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to see Atletico do, continue to push those two, two at the top for the title this season. And where is that, where does that leave the standings this week? Uh, so the standings are Barcelona, uh, nothing's changed at the top. So it's Barcelona, Atletico, Real Madrid, Villarreal and Sevilla uh, at the top. There's The only real differences are that uh, Sevilla and Villarreal continue to remain eight points apart. There's a bit of a gap. Villarreal being shooed in at, in fourth place at the moment. Uh, down at the bottom, I've gone for the bottom eight because it's always close in La Liga. Um, Levante on 17 points, Granada 20, Las Palmas 21, Espanyol. 22, Espanyol really slipping Sporting Gijon on 23 where they have a game in hand playing on Wednesday at home to Barcelona so they'll probably remain on 23. Uh, Rio 24 points, Betis in 14 from 26, Hatafe on 26 also and Valencia have won so they're up to 12th on 28 points. Good for them, good for them. Give us uh, a game to keep your eye out for this weekend. Any other news? Um, yeah, so game to look out for next week. Obviously, do check out the midweek game between Sporting Gijon and Barca. Uh, but I've gone for Malaga against Real Madrid next week. As I mentioned, Malaga have a good record against Real Madrid. They're in good form. They're good at home. So it'll be interesting to see how Madrid cope with that fixture. And in terms of news, um, it was a bit of a struggle, but I have found something, and that's to do with the Copa del Rey final venue. Um, there's a bit of controversy going on. As you know, Sevilla and Barcelona would be playing the final. They want it to occur at the Bernabeu because it's the biggest stadium that's a neutral ground. 
Real Madrid do not want Barcelona winning anything at their stadium and basically have stayed quiet on the subject with the hinting that they don't want it to happen. Sevilla coach uh, Unai Emery has come out and said he would rather the fixture was played in China than the Camp Nou because it would be like having another Messi on the field. So um, that's how strongly he feels about a neutral ground being played. So it'd be interesting to see what actually happens in that. Yeah, it's a very odd one, isn't it? That it is mm. very strange that they couldn't move it to a neutral venue. It will probably be the Vicente Calderon or the Mestalla. Yeah. So makes sense, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, well we'll keep an eye on that. But uh, thank you as always, and obviously I'll be back to you for the questions later on. There's a couple of La Liga ones in there this week. So we shall move on then, and we'll have got a, a brief little rundown of this week's best of the rest. I've just focused on the one league this week, and although we mentioned it last week, I want to come back to Portugal, because there was a very, very large game between two very large clubs on Friday evening, and that was between Porto and Benfica. Um, obviously, a lot of people know that these these two, their rivalry goes back a long, long way, bitter rivalry. Benfica were the home side, and they actually went in front on uh, on 18 minutes with the uh, the Fulham legend, Konstas Mitroglu, who, uh, who fired in for Benfica, a lovely creative move and slide past Casillas and everything seemed to be going pretty well however Porto were not done and Hector Herrera got the uh, got the level on 28 minutes really really good finishes actually it was, it was a pouring down there with rain in, in Portugal on the night and he used the, the slick surface just to, to slide the ball in at the far post sort of a, a real slide rule finish with almost a pass into the net and uh, the game was leveled up and it, and it really really was going to or could have gone either either way both sides were were pressing to uh, to try and get in front and Porto's form I think it's fair to say has not been very good of late in fact it's been pretty terrible and <laughs> truth be told but uh, Porto were in the end the victors Vincent Abubakar formerly of Lorient I know him well popped up in the 65th minute and after some clever sort of intricate play on the in the uh, on the edge of the penalty area between uh, between him and, uh, and and his partner on the edge of the box slopped through and into the net past the uh, the floundering goalkeeper for Benfica, Julio Cesar. Good work from Brahimi to, to set him up. And Porto ended up claiming the victory. Very, very big points for Porto. Away from home as well. Massive result. Um, very interesting as well. Interesting day for for uh, Pereira or Maxi Pereira, um, who's a former Benfica player. His whole career signed for Porto in the summer. Um, he was pelted with uh, various objects, uh, mostly rubbish, it has to be said. In fact, at one point, the referee had to stop the game to clear the rubbish off the touchline because every time he got the ball, he was the right back. Um, it was quite close to the stands and they just kept throwing rubbish onto the pitch to the point where the players couldn't even make runs down that right-hand side. So it was a very entertaining game. Massive result for Porto. So, and uh, just to put you in perspective, Sporting Lisbon, they they won, so they are still top. They won 4-0 at Nacional, two goals from Slimani, Adrian Silva, the captain, and Michel Murillo got the, win, got the winning goals there. So as it stands, it's a tight league this at the top for the uh, for the title. Sporting are top on 55, Benfica now 52, and Porto, with that victory, have closed the gap to just three points. They are on 49. So if you want entertainment, Portugal is definitely a league to keep an eye on. Very, very underrated league. And uh, that, that title chase just goes on. And the fixtures this weekend... He sees Benfica travel to a Passos de Ferreira, uh, who are in seventh, so that's that's no gimme. You got Porto at home to Morinense, which you would think Porto should should win that game. Morinense down in twelfth, but you just never know. And Sporting host Boa Vista, uh, who are also sixteenth and struggling, so could be another interesting weekend worth keeping an eye on. As for this midweek as well, we should just quickly make our listeners aware, if they don't already, that Champions League and Europa League football returns. Just very quickly, Champions League, Tuesday, PSG, Chelsea, Benfica, Zenit. On Wednesday, you've got Real Madrid away in Rome at Roma. And you've got Ghent, the underdogs against Wolfsburg. And then on the Thursday night, you've got a full card of Europa League football. I'm not going to read all the uh, fixtures because I'll be here forever, but I will just pull out a couple for you. Fiorentina, Spurs, Borussia Dortmund, Porto, Villarreal, Napoli, Augsburg, Liverpool, Galatasaray, Lazio 
and Marseille, Bilbao, probably sporting Lisbon Bay and Leverkusen as well. Some pretty tasty ties I there. I knew you'd leave out the Austrian fixture. <laughs> oh, sorry. Rapid Wien, uh, they play away at Valencia. So uh, another opportunity for Gary Neville to get a win, maybe. But we shall see. But there's some pretty tasty ties there, and it's, it's definitely worth, uh, worth keeping an eye. And the satchel will return, which is uh, myself. And if, if John's available, John will be with me. If not, somebody will be here in the chair next to me on Thursday night uh, stroke Friday morning we will go through all the results and have a little natter about it so do stay tuned right let's move on then and uh, as we always do we shall now move on to put somebody into focus in this week's hipster's choice Right then, this week's Hipster's Choice um, is all about the league I love. It's a Liga player, and this week I have gone for Nice's Vincent Cosiello. So what do we know about this young man? Well, he is young. He was born on the 28th of October 1995, making him just 20 years of age. He is French. He's 5 foot 6 inches, which is a good height, I'm reliably informed. I'm not five foot six, honest. He weighs 128 pounds. He wears the number 26 shirt for Nice, and he plays in the midfield. He's a right-footed player, and he wears the Nike Magista Opus boots. Now, he doesn't have a Twitter account, but he does have an Instagram account. He is Vincent Cosiello, all one word. So if you want to look him up, you can do so. So, what do we know? Well, he was born in Grasse in the southwest of France, 20 kilometres northwest of Cannes. And what is starting to look like a bit of a poignant foreshadowing. During France 98, when the when Cosiello was just two and a half years old, his friends and family told him that he was continually proclaim, pro, pro, proclaiming if I can put my teeth in, uh, me Zidane, Zidane me. So uh, no pressure there. In 2006, age 11, Cosiello joined AS Khan's youth system before moving to Nice in 2013, age 17, to continue his footballing education. An intelligent player who could pass and dribble, his skill was evident, but his diminutive frame put him somewhat of a disadvantage in the French game. He was put on a strength programme on uh, in, during the 2013-14 season with the Nice de Side. And prior to the 2014-15 season, Cosiello began training with the first team under Claude Puel, who recognised his talent in the young midfielder, and his first team debut came on October 29th in 2014, replacing the captain Didier Digard on the 23rd minute of a 3-3 draw against Metz in the knockout stage of the League Cup. Three days later, he made his Ligue 1 debut with the a, appearance of the 3-1 loss to Olympic Lyon, replacing uh, Gregory Puel, which is the manager's son, for those uh, who don't know, don't know that. In the 72nd minute, Cosiello would then go on to make six more league appearances with the first team, including three starts. And on June 8th, 2015, he signed his first professional contract. And in 2015-16, he's become one of the first names on Puel's team sheet. Now, he's made 24 appearances for Nice's season, and he's been an integral part of the club, reaching out, help, helping to reach them into third at the table now. And then currently tied in that position with St Etienne, as we mentioned earlier. And improved from improvement on last season, where they've actually finished 11th. The season before, they were 17th, so it's definitely an improvement. And he scored his first professional goal in Liga on the 27th of September of 2015 against St Etienne. It's a right foot volley from just outside the edge of the six yard box from a Pereira cross. He also notched an assist in Nice's 4 1 away win of the same fixture. Now, arguably one of his best performances of the season came during a 2-1 victory over, yes, you've guessed it, Lorient on January the 23rd, when he scored and indeed assisted who else but Hatem Ben Arfa. Quickly rattle through some of his appearances and stats to date. So 24 appearances this season, and he's made 22 starts. That's 1,890 minutes, three goals, four assists, seven yellow cards. An average power success rate of 90.9%, which is ninth in Liga overall, and 50.8% passes per game which is 33rd in Ligue 1. and he makes 3.2 tackles 1.1 interceptions per game roughly and he has an average rating of 7 out of 10 with one man of the match performance this season and as far as positioning goes for the most part Puel has favoured a 4-4-2 system where he's regularly operated on the right hand side of midfield with uh, Mendy obviously in the centre as the holding midfielder and uh, Seri as the other box box midfielder and typically Ben Arfa in behind the strikers but in November and December Puel switched to a 3-5-2 formation he has now reverted back to his 4-4-2 but in the 3-5-2 Cosiello was employed at the inside right position
position. So it sh sh kind of shows that he can play in very different positions when he is operating. And quickly, his strengths and weaknesses. Well, he's an agile, intelligent footballer with excellent vision and passing. He's always looking for space and keeps dribbling simple but effective, which coupled with his energy is ideal for the counter-attack. He is only five foot six, as we mentioned, and he'll never be proficient in the air or known for his physicality. However, he doesn't shy away from a tackle with seven yellow cards. That's proof of that. Sometimes he is a little bit rash in the challenge, and it's something that he might have to work on. Uh, listening to his interviews, it's clear that he's thoughtful, he's intelligent. In fact, he's completed his science bachelorette with honours, the French equivalent of A-levels, and he could and he could have been accepted into an engineering school in France, which will help immensely when, when he has he learns his craft. And his international appearances, well, obviously he's still young, but he has made one appearance for the French under-19s and two for the under-20s. Uh, he was actually called up for the under-21s in November 2015, and there is talk that he will be linked he or has been linked indeed with Arsenal and AC Milan. So I know the panelists are not particularly familiar with uh, Vincent Cosiello's work, but I am just going to turn to John briefly with that Milan link, and I'm just going to ask John simply, John, where do you, what do you see? Obviously, Milan are, are always famed for bringing through technically good players, and they they do seem a little bit light in the midfield area. So do you think a, a young diminutive, skillful 20-year-old is something that they could squidge into their midfield in the summer? Uh, definitely. They're, they're sort of the most creative uh, central player anyway is Montalivo, who is obviously uh, not no by no means at the end of his career yet, but it's sort of coming to that point. Um, they have Bonaventura, who's technically a very good player, probably one of the best in their team, uh, who thrives and is one of the real stars in their side. And it's the sort of player they, they need more of. They they lack creativity. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you're right. I, I don't, honestly, I don't know a lot about the player. Um, I, I did look him up earlier, and one of the first things that came up was um, Arsenal want to make transfer for the new Xavi. Um, <laughs> so, so no pressure at all. That story, I must admit, however, was in the Metro, so I assume that Arsenal will never be signing him. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, there, there's lots of different reports about how how good a player he is and how much promise there is for him. But obviously, he's very young, so it's a long way to go. Um, I always think with players of that age that they're generally better off staying in the league. They know for a few years to develop before making a big move, especially to a big club like Milan or Arsenal. That's, that's a whole lot of pressure. Um, slightly different at Arsenal because the uh, the way that Arsene Vega brings in player Milan at the moment aren't a particularly stable club so probably not the most sensible of choices uh, if that was on the table yeah I would be inclined to agree I think his style will probably suit a, a Serie A team eventually with the sort of the quick feet and the technical ability but mm. Liga is the right place for him he's getting games for Nice he's, he's just enhancing his reputation week on week and he's a player I, I'm very very keen on and there's a lot of young players in France as we will touch on throughout the weeks but but uh, he's definitely one to keep an eye on. And uh, for those of uh, you fine people who follow our Twitter account, you'll be aware that last week I started doing something a bit different with Hips's Choice. I started posting uh, just a couple of YouTube compilations, which we all know is is proof of how good a player is. Uh, but uh, if you do want to watch uh, a couple of highlights of Cosiello, I will post that uh, tomorrow so you can have a quick look at him in action. So he does yeah. the haircut I had during my early 20s. And your career has obviously gone from strength to strength. <laughs> Dur during your early 20s, Tom, of, of you which you are still years. in. <laughs> okay, but early time of being a 20-year-old, let's, let's go with that. Also, for people who dismiss the uh, the YouTube videos, um, one thing I would say is that, that one of the arguments is always, um, that, you know, they're only going to ever put their good bits in. Well, yeah. if someone did the YouTube highlights of my video skills, there would be no good bits. So that, I, that story doesn't always hold true. I concur. Yeah, I concur with that very much. So I don't think you could find my good bits of any I career. Heard you had great ball skills, John. Oh, well, there you go. That, well, that's a different podcast altogether. I was going to say, before this pod goes completely off the rails, I'll, I'll <laughs> rein it back in uh, and we'll focus on something positive once again. So, uh, as as usual, if you do want to follow Hipster's Choice, uh, the uh, the link for the timestamp will be on the website. So do go out and check out our previous, uh, our previous uh, Hipster's Choices. And for those asking, uh, the fact that we highlighted Serge Aurier, look, it's not our fault that he can't keep his mouth shut. It, we have nothing to do with sabotaging his career. It's not us, OK? I'm sorry. Right, let's move on and let's select this week's Team of the Week.
Right then, team of the week this week, we have employed a 4-1-2-1-2 formation. I think that's how it works. It's all very complicated, but I have to try and squeeze them all in. So without further ado, let's crack on with the players that have made it. In goal, we've gone for Marius Muller, uh, first ever Bundesliga 2 player to make team of the week. Went through it early with Drew, but the astonishing double save versus Paderborn gets him the nod. Uh, consolidation to uh, Kasper Schmeichel, who's also very good, but didn't quite make it this week. Uh, Jao Cancelo of Valencia set up the graded goal and was a constant threat down the right-hand side for Valencia in Gary Neville's first victory, so he makes the right-back slot. And at left-back is Luca Dean, the man from PSG, who signed to Roma, scored a rocket against Carpi. Really is worth looking that one up, by the way. Uh, he was uh, pretty solid down that left-hand side and looks to have settled in Rome nicely. The centre-back Jonas Olsen of West Brom. West Brom were a real smash and grab victory 1-0 at Everton. He technically kind of scored the winner, although Rondon did steal it off him, but it was his, his goal-bound header that got the 1-0 win and he was solid throughout. And he's joined by Robin Knocker from Wolfsburg, who scored the crucial second oh and uh, was indeed very important <laughs> in, the, uh, in the victory. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. Hey, I think... <laughs> I pick the team back in your box. Currently, uh, Doliso, second week in a row that he makes a side this week. He's promoted from the bench to the first team. Uh, he was uh, assisting Titi's goal and Corday's goal, as well as scoring a cracking fourth himself. The wide man gone with Mohamed Salah of Roma very much back to his best, employed in the sort of free roll by Spalletti, two assists and a goal and a shot on the post and he's very much back to his high standards and speaking of back to his best Pedro of Chelsea, he makes the left hand side two sublime finishes in one on one situations, uh, looks more like the Barca player that we all remember in his Chelsea shirt now uh, Karim Azuma of Trois well there's a Trois player who's managed to make the uh, the lineup incredible, uh, he set up the first and then scored the next two and Trois winning away from home Excellent performance from the uh, creative technician in behind the front two. And our front two. This isn't bad as front twos go. Robert Lewandowski for Bayern Munich. Pretty much the perfect centre forward performance. Two superb finishes. Just a, such a deadly striker. And speaking of deadly, Luis Suarez. Just unreal. Scored three, set up two, and hit the post. Just completely unplayable, I think it's fair to say. So that's the front two. And then having a look at our substitutes bench, I've gone with Victor Ruiz of Villarreal, faultless at centre back in their 1 0 victory over Malaga. Yannick Gerhardt of FC Köln, a goal and assist, pretty much ran Köln's midfield versus Frankfurt in their 3 1 victory. Uh, Mikel Orozabal, as uh, Tom Bett pointed out, for Sociedad, two superb assists in their 3 0 victory over Granada. And William of Chelsea, consistently Chelsea's best player I think it's fair to say, he got a goal and an assist in their victory over Newcastle Cristiano Ronaldo, never usually on the bench he is this week, two goals and an assist over Bill Bow, pretty much back to his best and rounding out the bench, I've gone for Chiro Immobile of Torino, his best game since his return, two goals, and ran his legs off and uh, Danny Welbeck of, of Arsenal, last second winner in the crucial victory over Leicester City he scored when it mattered most off the bench to make himself of a hero. So there you go. That's this week's uh, team of the week. Now I, I have to go to Drew because he's having a good old uh, a good old chuckle here about uh, Robin Knopf. <laughs> Come on then, Drew. Give me give me your reasons why. Me. <laughs> the K is silent. Okay, sorry. Well, I I'll say things how I want. Damn it. Hey, t- I'll, I'll be honest. I thought he was just laughing at the name Kanaka because I was laughing at that as well because I'm childish. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> And, and uh, Tom rightly points out, Arthur Bell has two goals, not assists. I do apologise. Sorry, Tom. But, hey, I got the player in. That's the most important thing. Uh, and, hey, if Tom can say Gijon, I can say Kanoka. Thank you. <laughs> I don't say now, Gijon. Do you, do you say knowledge or knowledge? It's the same thing. Knowledge. Anyway, let's move <laughs> on. <laughs> Uh, if if, uh, if if I wanted pronunciations done correctly on this podcast, I wouldn't, have Danny. I wouldn't have Danny on the pod. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> right. Let's move on then. And uh, we'll round off our podcast this week, as we always do, as we take questions from you, the listeners. It's this week's Onion Bag. 
Right then, gentlemen, if we can uh, get past our pronunciations, let's see what questions we've got in the onion bag this week. We're going to start with a question for Tom. This comes from Ross at Ross Bramble, who's our Breakfast Pod co-host with my good self. And he wants you to talk a bit more about this penalty. So he says, RE Messi's penalty, Rainbow's Rainbow, uh, sorry, Neymar's Rainbow flick last season, and Madrid's 10 against Rio. What are Spanish ethics and do they have a place? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think there there is a place for them, but uh, I think people do choose to ignore them <laughs> quite clearly. But uh, no, the, the, okay, I'll start with the 10-2. The 10-2 was a bit exaggerated. I don't think Real Madrid should have gone all out with the 10 goals. I think they should have sat back up at some point, just had a bit of respect for Rayo because they literally did mentally destroy them as a team uh, with only nine men. The penalty, I think, personally, I have no problem with. The only problem I have with it is that it shouldn't have counted because Suarez encroached on the penalty area. But, um, uh, yeah, but it, I have no problem with that sort of goal being taken. It's, it's completely within the rules. If it wasn't, if it wasn't like deserved it happening, they would change the rules and not allow it. But it hasn't happened, and, and therefore it should be fine. Um and what was the rainbow flick? Yeah, so that's that. I don't see any problem with that. That's Neymar pulling off an excellent piece of skill, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I love Neymar as a player and and love a skillful football like that, not just on the street but on the pitch as well. Fair enough. You you answer very thoroughly. I like it. I'm I'm with Ross on this one. I I, I didn't like it at all. I thought it was. Yeah, I just You're I, boring. I know. <laughs> I know. I just I just didn't. I don't like the the the, the blatant. Bicky taking. It's taking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But hey ho, a good, good question. And uh, thank you for answering that one. Uh, it's one for John next. Can, this is from Pete Kenley at Kenley Peter. Can Napoli regroup or are Juve now going to run away with it? That is Serie A, of course. Um, uh, it's tough to know because, uh, you know, Higuain was visibly upset at the end of the game. Um, and uh, actually, funnily enough, Peter did tweet me during uh, just at the end of it saying that Higuain was quite poor. I, I didn't think he was necessarily poor in the game. I, f- I just thought he was well marked and didn't get many chan- or any chance, really, a clear chance. Um, and he's the sort of striker that does need some service. Um, he's also up against one of the best defences in the league, despite the fact Kierling is missing. The... the the, it will be interesting to see how they respond against Milan because Milan are in good form. Um, obviously, the Europa League coming up. Juve at the same time have Bayern Munich as well, um, and it looks like Bonucci should be okay for it now. They're saying he'll probably miss the Bologna game, which wouldn't shouldn't trouble uh, trouble them too much. Um, but Juve have actually got more injuries to worry about than Napoli have at the moment. So I think Napoli can keep pushing them. That was def- but that was definitely their biggest uh, and most difficult game of the season to go. Um, the, the the away away leg to Juve, so it'll be interesting to see. I hope they can keep going because it, it would be a shame now after the fantastic first half of the season we've had for Juve just to romp on and just start getting more and more points clear. But there's only one point in it at the moment, so it's all still to play for. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a been an entertaining league, and uh, I hope Napoli do push them because I think it makes Juve a better side as well. Um, question for Drew. This one comes from Simon Collins, who's uh, also appeared with us on the Breakfast Show. And he wants to know about Thomas Tuchel. Do you think he's destined for a big job? Obviously, outside of the job he's got now. Some say that he's an ideal replacement for Pochettino if he leaves Spurs. What do you reckon? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I do like his brand of football. Obviously, I'm slightly biased because I do support Dortmund. But, I mean, it's, it's tough to get a bigger job than Dortmund in Germany unless you go to Bayern Munich. And since Ancelotti is coming in, uh, he's going to be at at Dortmund for a while, but that gives them at least it gives them the time, uh, however many years it might be, you know, three, four, five, six to sort of really get everything managerially correct, so he can bring it to his next posting. But you never know; German managers do like to stay in Germany, uh, much like most of the players. So I mean, I could see him um, going to maybe the Premier League. Um, his 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 brand of football does suit the league as well. Um, but I think it'll only be made for a certain amount of teams. It, Spurs would be one of them, but I, I don't ever see him going from Dortmund to Spurs, honestly. If he's going to leave Dortmund, it's going to be to either sort of um, a move that's going to be either you know a, a vertical 
or um, at least, you know, he's not going to go down. So he's going to go up, he's going to stay at that same level. And, and no offense to Spurs fans, but Dortmund's a level above. So, yeah, you know, we'll see. Uh, I would agree. Good question. That, yeah. Good question. A uh, couple of quick Liga ones, which I'll just rattle through. Um, A1 at odds first. Can you see Sergio Aurier coming back into the PSG squad, or is it over for him now? And on a similar vein, Pigman J. Hamkenstein, any idea how long Aurier will be frozen out of PSG squad? And did you jinx him with the hipster's choice? Uh, we've, we've addressed that. Pigment. Uh, yeah, it was all us. Apologies. Um, to answer the question quickly, yes, I do see him still having a future, but my God, is he going to have to grovel? The only X factor in this is Laurent Blanc still on the manager. He was very, obviously, <laughs> blunt and ignorant about him uh, on this this Periscope interview, and Blanc is, uh, yeah, it'd be hard to trust him. Um, so I think the fact that he's probably one of the best right backs in Europe will, will give him a pass but he's skating on very thin ice. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. And uh, another one here from at clockend underscore lad. He says, do you think PSG will soon be as a European super club, i.e. Real Barca Bayern? And can you see anyone in Liga competing for the years to come? Uh, yes, I do see them being a superpower simply because of the money they've got. The only issue is the league they're playing in. So it kind of addresses both, both questions in one, really. I don't see anyone competing with them unless they have an amazing run like, for example, the Montpellier side of a couple of years ago, or indeed a, a club like a Lyon uh, or, a, or a Marseille in particular getting some injection of, of large money. Um, it's a sad state of affairs, unfortunately. The simple fact is PSG have got so much money and so many talented players, there's every chance they could be a European superpower. So, uh, And as I've mentioned on this pod a few times, I have got them down to win this year's Champions League. So when they come crashing out, you can all mock me. Right, so I have another question about Spain, Tom. This is Czech at Czechy Nando's Lad. Out of Almeric Laporte and Jose Maria Jimenez de Vargas, which one do you think is best suited to the Premier League? Uh, first of all, great handle twi- of his Twitter name, Checky Nando's. I'm loving that. Um, but uh, for me, uh, I Chris knows my admiration for, for Laporte, but uh, Jimenez is my favourite centre-back in the world. I think he's more suited because simply he's more physical and he's willing to do more things in terms of putting his body on the line in defensive areas than Laporte is. Uh, he's also more consistent and, and part of, the, in my recent memory, the best back five in football. Uh, and doesn't look out of place as a 20-year-old. So that's my reasons for it, and I think he can slot into any of the back fours in, in the top half of the table. So you, so you, do you rate both players highly? I rate well? both players high enough to both. Like, they could both play in the Premier League. I just, I, I, as a manager of any of the top four sides, I would rather him and F than Laporte. Fair enough, fair enough, yeah. Appreciate. I know you disagree. <laughs> no, no, I, no I, I, I mean, I, to be fair, I don't know enough about uh, him and De Vargas to, to compare, but I, I do like Laporte, I really do. Interesting to see. I do think he'll move this summer. Be, be intrigued to see where. Um, let's give John some love, shall we? Uh, Czechaholic. There's lots of Czechy people. It's great. Um, out of Marco Verratti and Paul Pogba, which one would you make would you think would make it at Barca or Real Madrid? So, based on your Serie A knowledge, who do you think fits the bill best? Oh, um, to go to Barca or Real Madrid. Uh, it's funny because they're not, they're, neither of them are the same player. Um, Pogba is the flashy sort of superstar type player, so he'd probably be better at Real. And Verratti would actually suit Barca better. Um, I know, obviously, you watch more PSG than I do, but his passing, I think, is better than Pogba's. Don't get me wrong, Pogba is an amazing passer of the ball, but it just, the, as for the the name and the brand and all that kind of thing that goes with it, I think Pogba would suit Real Madrid better than he would Barcelona and the style of play. Um, and the same with Verratti to um, to Barca instead of Real. I just think it's a better fit. The, the weird thing is that Real Madrid actually probably need a Marco Verratti more than they would have Paul Pogba, but it doesn't sell as many shirts. Yeah, very, very true. And some interesting comments from uh, Philippe Claire on this week's Football Weekly about Paul Pogba. So there's a little plug for them. Do give that a listen. Very interesting. Uh, final question. Uh, Joshua Kaklukaskis. I always get Josh's name wrong. 
Kakluskas. There we go. Hey, much better. Um, out of with, sorry, with Pep going out and Ancelotti coming in, who do the panel think will be sold? He also wanted to ask about Aurier, which obviously we've covered. So what I've asked my panelists to do on this one is just give me a name and a very brief reason as to why they think he would be sold from Bayern. Drew, I'll start with you. Who do you think Ancelotti might ship out? Oh, and why? It's uh, David Alba, I think. Um, simply put, he he's won everything possible with Bayern. Um, and, and City are going to need a left back. I don't think Alexander Kolarov is going to be at the level that Pep's going to want. And obviously, Gail Clichy just... We don't even have to mention Gail Clichy, to be honest. So uh, he's going to want to upgrade most of the positions in his back four, and I think left back is going to be uh, uh, one of the primary ones he's going to look after. I think that a lot of suits that, and he can also, he's, he's tactically flexible. He's proven he can play center back at Bayern. He's played holding midfielder. He's played up further up on the left. He's played in center mid, and and tack, uh, Pep does like tactical flexibility, and he provides that, and he very much loves working with Pep. He, he's spoken out uh, numerous times about how much he, he, he loves playing on him, so I, I would be shocked if he actually doesn't move for him. So Interesting. And Tom, what do you reckon? Uh, probably Lewandowski simply has been linked with Real Madrid a lot in past seasons gone by. The only problem with that is, one, who to buy and replace him with because there isn't anyone out there other than Suarez, in my opinion, who's better and they're not going to get him. Uh, you could say replace him with Benzema because he'd be the one going out to replace him, but uh, they don't have to sell him. They don't need to sell him. I don't see why they would sell him, so uh, I'd be surprised if he did move. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I know John wants uh, wants to go last, so I'll uh, I'll steam in at the side here. I'll go with Mario Götze um, purely because I I think that he's a player who probably needs a change. I feel like he's gone a little bit stale. I could see him being a good fit at Liverpool, which is a bit upsetting because I think he's better than that. Sorry, Liverpool fans. Um, but yes, I, I could see him possibly be, possibly moving on. I also think, weirdly, he would he would suit other English clubs, but Liverpool just seems like the, the most obvious fit there. John, have you got a name for us who you think, maybe? Yeah, I'm going to cheat and say two people. That's why I had to go last. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> um, it, it, I think either one of, or I don't think both, but possibly one of Vidal or uh, Thiago Alcantara. Um, Alcantara, an obvious one. Um, could end up at City with Pep. Uh, he followed him there. Um, maybe even a move back to Barca, uh, possibly. I don't know. That, I suppose that's a possibility. But I think the only reason he went to Bayern was because Pep was going there. Um, and City could use a player like that, certainly a bit deeper in the midfield. Um, as for Vidal, it, it's a case of how much of the sort of stories about him at the moment turning up drunk to training and whether that's true or not and sort of... Uh, some of the bad publicity that's been going on. Um, if if any of that is true, then uh, Bayern certainly don't like having players like that that call, uh, cause bad attention to the club. So he could be out. Very true. And the only other one I would throw in is Javi Martinez, which we discussed pre-pod. Maybe he could freshen up with a move as well. But there we go. There's plenty of names for you. Final question. I'm going to stick with you for this one, John. It's uh, again from Simon, Simon Collings. Um, and I'm intrigued by your answer on this because he's picked two Italian managers. He said, who do you think would be the best person for Chelsea or indeed Abramovich to hire at the end of the season? Now, he's picked out the names of Allegri or Conte. So would you pick either of those two or is there someone else you think would be a good fit? Um, they've both been linked with the job uh, Allegri's being linked a lot at the moment Juve is saying he's not going anywhere um, I think for Chelsea and what Abramovich wants then Allegri would be the better choice Conte is a lot more pragmatic and the football would not be particularly exciting which we know is something Abramovich wants more and his record in Europe isn't superb although I think he's a very good manager he hasn't got a great Champions League record um, Allegri's is better um, obviously getting Juve to the final which was quite unexpected so we'll see how they get on this year but um, it'll be difficult to get him out of Juventus um, but obviously they, you know, Premier League clubs can offer a lot more money um, so yeah he he would be my pick over the two uh, obviously if, if Allegri was to go then the talk is already that Conte would just uh, leave the Italian job and go straight back in at Juve. Um, so it would be a fairly easy transition for all parties. So the Juve are sort of covering themselves from all angles, depending on what happens in the summer. 
Yes, indeed. I still have a sneaky suspicion that certain Diego Simeone will be popping across to uh, to West London. Although I guess a lot depends on this uh, transfer situation. So watch this space. Watch this space. Good questions this week. Thank you very much to everybody that sent them in. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it from us. Just a couple of things to uh, slide your way as far as plugs go. Uh, Drew, let's start with you. You got a Hall of Fame blog as usual on Friday. Who are we doing this week? Well, we're going to take a trip to Asia, and it's going to be a Japanese footballing icon, Hidetoshi Nakata. So it should be fun. Splendid. And last week, Yari Lippmann, and that one is still available, as are all of your your fine uh, snippets of work. So please do have a look at those on our website under the Hall of Fame section. Uh, Tom, also, you have done an interview which has been live for a couple of days now. Give us just a quick bit of info again. Yeah, yeah, I interviewed Sky Sports commentator for La Liga, John Driscoll. That is out. We discussed a lot of things. If you like your transfers, we discussed all the things to do with Neymar and Ronaldo and Griezmann. So uh, go check it out. Splendid. And John, myself and yourself, we have an interview coming out on Thursday. That's this Thursday coming. Do you want to tell the listeners about that? Uh, yeah, we interviewed Mina Rizuki. Uh, some people may know her. She works for the BBC, um, for ESPN. Uh, lots of different outfits. Um, she, she's a really great journalist. Um, really knows her stuff on Serie A. She does cover other leagues as well, but it's a very Serie A-focused interview. Um, and the best thing about it is that me and Chris hardly talk at all through the entire thing. Um, we just sit there being amazed by the sort of stories um, and the knowledge she's got. Um, some really interesting things about uh, the higher-up uh, sort of things going on at clubs as well, at sort of board level. Um so yeah, really, really good. Drew will like it as well because there's a great little bit of a, of a history story as to why she she supports Juve. So. Yes, yeah. Great. And uh, as John Warwood did confirm, oh, I think we could have let me to talk for four hours. She would have happily done it. She was just yeah, <laughs> quite comfortably. Just, just... I didn't realise she was so into fashion. John saying she worked for so many different outfits. Oh, very good. Uh, well, she did work for Vogue. So yeah, she did work for Vogue. Yes, yes. But you, you'll have to find out how how she enjoyed that. Indeed. Whether she enjoyed it's that. Some very yeah. interesting stories, but it's an excellent interview. Um, and we do have other interviews coming up that are already recorded. We'll touch on those next week. Um, final things to plug: the breakfast show is live. We did that last night, myself, Danny, and Ross, covering all things English. We also have a look at uh, League One and League Two as well, as well as the new blog that's going up, which is from a contributor. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Matthew Shaw. Uh, Matt's blog will be posted uh, at, by the time this podcast is live. Actually, that will be available as well. I'll tweet some links. Uh, Matthew sent us a very kind, short blog just about Polish football and his experience of going to games. So that's well worth a, a, a quick read through. And thank you very much, Matt, for that. Um, and the final thing to say is thank you to those who have left us iTunes reviews. I think we've got 10 up now. They're all five stars. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Some very, very kind feedback we've received. Um, and please keep keep them coming guys if you, if you get I think it takes around about five minutes if you've got an iTunes account you just log in stick the five styles or whatever you rate us as just give us a very short couple of paragraphs of what you like or maybe what you don't like preferably what you do like of course and uh, it helps to get our, our sort of a word out there and it helps us to get these fantastic guests on board to interview so thank you ever so much for that and final thing, as we say, we've got the satchel coming up on Thursday night stroke Friday morning where we will go through all of the European action. Right, that is everything. I promise you, we're out of here. Thank you very, very much for listening as always and did your continued support. And thank you to my panellists, to John, to Drew and to Tom. Cheers, Chris. No worries, Chris. Thank you. And finally, as I will always say, and we will always say, keep your beard strong and your glasses trendy, and the football hipsters will be back in your ears very soon. Oh, quel geste! Quel geste! L'égalisation de Zlatan Ibrahimovic! Andres Iniesta se anima, Andres! Andres tocó la evolución de Neymar, Messi! Alles aus sich rauszuholen, verfolgt von Schmelzer. Müller, vorbei an Weidenfeller. Müller, Bayern München ist Pokalsieger. Capo battere Insigne con il destro a Gero. Und er rettet. Favoloso. Sie kommt für die Nette. Favoloso.